Let's do it. Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? So we are almost at the end. And I can, yes. But by the clap that we just had, of course, we've had two full days, or a day and a half, I guess. For me, it's been nine months. Uh, <laughs> a day and a half of a great conference. And it is my absolute true honor to introduce our next keynote speaker. I personally think we have saved the absolute best for last. So Peter Coffey needs no introduction. Uh, he is a VP of Strategic Initiatives at Salesforce. Uh, worked with PCMag and eWeek for 18 years. Uh, has an MBA from Pepperdine. Uh, Personally, I remember in 2009, he came to Ottawa and he spoke over at the Chateau Laurier to a room of about 100 people. And it was at that point in time I went, I, if I stay in the Salesforce ecosystem, wherever he speaks, I want to go listen. I love learning. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, every single time I hear Mr. Coffey speak, I feel smarter. So it is my, my absolute pleasure to turn the table over to Mr. Peter Coffey. All right, thank you, Nick. I didn't coordinate closely with uh, Leah or Chris about the succession of three keynotes, but I'm realizing that we did wind up with what could only have been planned. Leah basically told you how to get your act together. Chris told you how to get other people's act together. And my job is to show you why we need a whole bunch of people who really have their expletive deleted act together. Because I need to show you the world in which we are operating right now. Most of our companies don't realize it. In which we are going to be operating tomorrow. And most of us are going to be working more years than we ever would have before and are going to have to be continually adjusting, upskilling, and strengthening ourselves for that. And of course, you know, the fact that I've got two grandkids uh, means I've got a dog in the fight. So I really want to make that happen. And so I'm not going to talk about CRM, hardly at all. I want to talk about reality checks on, on four fundamental areas. People, the connections among people, the resources on which people rely, and the systems that emerge from all of this, and what your role is. Because the old IT person had a career based on being able to make the tech do stuff. Well, I'm sorry, we've pretty much taken care of that part of it. Now you have to make it do the right stuff. And I used the comment yesterday on the Women in Technology panel on which the one man in the room took, you know, talked way too much of the time, and I'm sorry about them. Genuinely, I am. But the degree to which the Salesforce ecosystem is unique among every IT ecosystem since the last 10 minutes of Hidden Figures, in that women are tremendously powerful in the Salesforce ecosystem, and I really do believe it's because the guys didn't realize that you weren't the Roomba cleaning up the contact database, you were the Terminator out there to take out the legacy practices. And it is so cool when I'm, in, when I'm with the Salesforce community to realize how, how much more balanced the room feels in so many ways. But all this is going to happen in an accelerating world. It's difficult enough to choose the right direction under these conditions. But you don't even get to coast once you've done it. You have to be under continuous acceleration. Pat Gelsinger at VMware said a while ago, try to wrap your head around this idea this frantic pace of change that everyone says is so defining of our modern era is the slowest pace of change that you will be allowed to relax and enjoy for the rest of your working life. Yeah, I heard, I heard, I heard, a, I heard a, a, a despairing cry over there. The good news is you've hitched your wagon to the, the uh, platform that, that can carry you there, that can deal with that acceleration because frankly, None other does. And it blows my mind that we've been doing this. It was 15 years ago that Mark and I had the breakfast conversation that I wrote a column about in eWeek about 
what a platform as a service would need to be. Not all the old complexities plus new ones, but many of the old complexities abstracted away and turned into platform services. We talked about that 15 years ago. We began selling platform licenses 12 years ago. We had a multi-tenant coding capability that preser preserved all of the guarantees of that platform 11 years ago. And all of those things are still unique. No one has something that does what Apex does, and, that's, and it's been out there for a long time. And the advantage, of course, of not being dismissed by the legacy dinosaurs as being something that doesn't matter, because for the first three years I was at the company, they would say, oh, only little companies need that stuff. Big companies have real IT. Well, once they realized that they did, in fact, need to do what we were doing and started to try, boy, they made us look a lot smarter. Because all of a sudden people realized that we'd only been making it look easy. And that very well-resourced, very skillful companies, when they attempted to take on this radically new model, didn't find it easy. So uh, adopting the phrase of your uh, event title, you know, True North, um, I want to talk about truth and about trailblazing and about letting you, you know, go back to work Monday morning with a conviction that you are not only capable, but that you are ready to, to lead and to tell people where they need to be going. The old business IT alignment was business going downstairs and telling IT, you know, try to remember what we do here. The new business IT alignment is IT breaking down the door of the boardroom and saying, you guys have to figure out, I'm sorry it is mostly guys, you guys have to figure out the world in which you're going to be and doing the old thing better, faster, cheaper is gonna be doing the wrong thing. Forward-looking statements, yeah, I might make a few. Einstein is very well known for things that mostly took place during the last third of his career. The most interesting things he did took place a long time before E equals MC squared. They took place when he started asking very simple questions. What would the world look like if you were sitting on a beam of light? What would the world look like if, if you could move at the speed? You should be able to look at the beam and see not an oscillating field, you should be able to see a static field except that there's no such thing. And the whole insight that led to relativity and everything else came from a very simple question. A simple question. What would the world look like from a different point of view? And so when we've adopted the Einstein brand, a fabulous brand, a brand that everybody loves, there is no baggage associated with the brand of Einstein except for people who've actually read his biography and know some of the other things. We pay the um, Hebrew University, which is the custodian of his estate, a very nice amount of money for the use of his image and name. And so what he would ask, what would Einstein ask in a situation, I think is a powerful tool for cracking it open and getting people not to give you a better, faster, cheaper answer to the old question, which is what IT is very good at doing, tremendously good at doing. We can build bigger, faster, stronger silos like nobody's business. It's funny how lately, when I talk about silo busting, no one needs to have it explained what that means, and all of them will say, oh my gosh, absolutely, we know we need to do that. Can you help us with that? That's not the situation that we had 10 years ago. And people here, E equals MC squared, when he wrote the letter to President Roosevelt and said, you know, if you got some uranium together under the right conditions, it could make a really kick-ass bomb. By the time he wrote that letter, he was already world famous for something that had essentially nothing to do with that. He had an idea. He had an idea that space was bent by matter. Someone once said, you know, Space tells matter where to go, and matter tells space how to curve. And the problem is, the biggest thing around that would bend light enough to notice is the sun, and looking at light as it passes the sun is kind of hard to do, because the sun itself is kind of bright. But during an eclipse, you have this unique moment when the sun's light is no longer blinding you and you can look at the stars, you can look past the sun at the stars that are you know, close to it in the sky and see something very interesting. They don't seem to be where they're supposed to be. The light as it passes the sun has been bent and if you go back and look at the beam as if it had not been bent, the star seems to be in a different place. The fact that he predicted this crazy and completely unexpected phenomenon to many decimal places of accuracy made him 
literally overnight world famous. It was on front pages of newspapers all over the world when the expedition sent back and said, he's right. That's a remarkable thing to have happen when you can become world famous simply by saying, you know, if you just look here where you've never looked before because it was too hard to do, you're going to see something really interesting. And I really feel that this is where we are with the Einstein brand. It's unfortunately so constantly conflated with AI. That's not the point. The point is it lets us get stuff out of data that was simply too hard to get before. There are very expensive aircraft being kept in the air today because the Air Force went to Delta Airlines and said, can you help us figure out what to do about you know, analyzing data off of our aircraft and you know, preventive maintenance and improving their, their ability to stay in the air. I mean, maybe get a few more decades of, of service out of these aircraft. And Delta Airlines, a fine Salesforce customer, had to show them how to turn that data into something that machine learning could actually consume, which turns out not to be at all straightforward. And if you think, oh, well, that's really complicated stuff, that's flying C5s. Well, I'm sorry, Deloitte says that the average brand is operating 39 disparate systems, things where the data dictionary is not coherent, where the data sources are not readily available, to manage customer relationships. And so you have these splinters and fragments and shards of process and identity littering the, the landscape, and the customer is tired of it. They know they can have better. They are convinced they can have better. If you haven't seen Salesforce Predict Retail in 2019, it's a great download. I would encourage you to go find it. It's full of really good stuff. And so if you don't think of us as the CRM cloud on top of the platform, if you really understand what the platform represents, it's not this. The old organization with n sources of data had order of n squared connections among those sources and every time you plugged in a new one you had to add n plus one more connections. Not scalable, not in any sustainable way. It's not at all obvious how much blood and treasure, including the six and a half billion for MuleSoft, yeah, subtle there, huh? subtle graphics, um, we have put into giving you a system where adding one new data source requires one new connection. That's scalable. That's going to encourage people to look past the sun and see some stars that weren't where they thought they were and be able to start doing some interesting things because now they're empowered to ask these questions. And then once you've got the data, well, you don't want to lift and shift it all. You don't want to build a massive, new, expensive, complicated, time-consuming data lake. Everyone thinks they'd like to have one until they look at what the time and the budget would be. But what we did with Customer 360 when we announced it at Dreamforce last year, say you don't have to build a data lake to have the illusion of one. That's what the MuleSoft API orientation gives you, is the ability to connect to data by adding chapters to the book of, of language that you have of process instead of drawing diagrams of connection. Because let's face it, those diagrams that we were very pleased to be able to draw 10, 12 years ago, today they're obsolete almost immediately. It was difficult enough when the data sources were all internal. But now most of the really interesting data emerges from other places, from devices and processes that didn't even exist. And so the ability to unify without duplicating is key. But once you've got it all in that virtual resource pool, what does it tell you? It tells you what Tableau lets you figure out, which is tremendously powerful stuff. Two days after the acquisition was announced, I was on the um, uh, BART going into San Francisco with someone from Slalom. I know we got some Slalom people in the room. And he was telling me about a customer who had a complete deer in the lights experience You know, when, when they were being asked to provide insights on which of several new retail locations should be the pilot site for a new initiative. And they were very simple data-driven questions. And they had no idea how to take a certain three-letter uh, legacy IT portfolio and get it to give them that insight. And the Solemn people basically were you know, back from the future. And they said, oh, yeah, we can do that. And did it with Tableau in a matter of hours. That's the power. It's tremendously exciting really going to be different when all these things are used in a coordinated way. It helps that we no longer have to pay expensive people who don't actually exist, called knowledge engineers, to structure all of human knowledge into a form that a machine can easily consume. We'll just let it read the documentation and answer questions about what it sees. 
read a news story, and ask it questions like, so when was Obama's keynote address? July. Where was the keynote address? Democratic National Convention. Does it know what a national convention is? No. It's not smart. But it can answer the question in a way that a person finds useful. It's a good assistant. It augments you. It does not replace you. And being able to see things, being able to recognize objects, being able to you know, see a barcode in a scene and say, oh, OK, now I know where I am in the process plant. Now I know which pump that is. Now I you know, know that that thing is the wrong color for what it should be. We're going to build very visually and um, uh, linguistically rich environments when we don't have to limit ourselves to what you can do with a touch screen or a, or a mouse. When Tony Stark walks into his house, does he walk over to the, to the wall and start tapping things on a touch screen? He just talks. He just talks and tells Jarvis what he needs. And Jarvis may even tell him things that he didn't know. Um, Mr. Stark, would your request for an omelet have anything, have it been affected in any way by the air-to-air -air missile on its way in from the helicopter offshore? Things like that, you know, anticipating your needs. So the promise of Einstein is that we will begin with this massively connected planet, which we did not have before. We will turn the AI process from what we were doing in the late 1980s, this unscalable process of training knowledge engineers who don't exist to get humans to explain what they do, which they're not really able to do very well, and turn the result into a, uh, an expert system. No, we're gonna do the other thing they talked about in the 50s, build algorithms of learning and hardware that can represent learning and, and let it work at scale, because now that data is available. And we're going to deploy it into the environment where selling and servicing and marketing actually are happening. Because among the things that the legacy dinosaurs love to talk about is how many thousand data scientists they've hired. Well, I've penciled out the number of actual customers they have for their CRM, and they can assign one data scientist to every customer individually with a backup for lunch hour. They don't have anything from which to learn. But we've got most of the world's best selling, servicing, and marketing happening in our environment, which means we've got a lot of food to feed the beast. And that is going to make an enormous difference. This is why it's going to learn. We're going to make it accessible to human beings. And we're going to generate customer advantage. We're not going to do stupid technology tricks. And I have been personally pleasantly surprised by how quickly the promises of Einstein have turned into features and from features into behaviors, things that our customers are actually doing. It's tremendously exciting because what this enables is the experience of the future. People ask me, what does the future look like? I don't know if it's possible to answer that question in a useful way without using the word experience. This is Newport Center Mall in Southern California. And someone describing it said, you can't fail to be impressed by the way this place was designed to be a place that crafts an experience, programmed pleasantness. What an interesting phrase. A place where you actually want to buy stuff. You just feel great being there. It was an engineered result. And of course, today, we would see an Apple store as the next generation of that. But that Newport Center Mall, all the language on here talking about in the future we're going to go beyond functional necessity into prefabricated experience. Alvin Toffler wrote that in 1970 in Future Shock. He knew where we were going. Why didn't we do it in 1970? Did you know what a mobile phone looked like in 1970? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stop by the luggage store to pick up a case for my phone. We didn't have the ability to put knowledge in people's hands, in their heads, in their earpieces. We didn't have the ability to measure what they were doing and infer what they would like to have if only they knew they could possibly have it. One of my favorite stories is you know, how when Apple introduced the iPod, it was regarded as overpriced, underfeatured, in a world full of MP3 players. And yet, they didn't bring it out as a player. They brought it out as the songs you want in your pocket because they brought out iTunes to go with it. That was by far the greater innovation. Sony had three different divisions competing against each other to sell MP3 players at the time. And three years later, in the Oxford English Dictionary, there's a new word, podcast. People have been downloading stuff from the internet for a long time. Apple literally redefined the language of getting stuff off the net. 
by engineering an experience around it. So what's it going to look like to live in the future? Well, initially it's going to be a lot of touch screens, a lot of touch counters, a lot of road signs. This is a fantastic video, actually a pair of videos called A Day Made of Glass, made by Corning Glass, because they hope to sell a lot of this stuff. As a stockholder, I thoroughly approve. <laughs> and someone else said, what's ambient computing? It's a constant experience that preserves continuity across devices, time, and space. Do you know, we've got anecdotal accounts of people shopping online on their phone and then saying, oh, can't, can't get what I need through the app here. How can I not have to start all over again when I go to the, the web browser? And they have to take and mail themselves a screenshot off their phone because it's the only way to preserve any kind of continuity of experience. Well, that's not acceptable. It's just not. I mean, your handheld and your iPad and your car and the voice in your house, those all just need to be different lenses through which you're viewing a single experience. That's what it means to design from the experience outward instead of from the app inward and wind up with all that fragmentation. Oddly, this is not a very new idea either. Angela Arendt, before she left Burberry to go to work with um, Apple, uh, actually you know, had this conversation with Mark Benioff back in uh, 2008. When they talked about creating Burberry World, Angela said, this is nuts. We've got an app, and we've got a store, and we've got a website, and they look like three different companies because they were built by three different teams. And, and they, they claim they have framed at Burberry the paper napkin on which they sketched out the idea of Burberry World. When you're trying to get people to change their behavior, you can't say you're doing it wrong, because at that point, the only way that they cannot be the loser in the conversation is by convincing themselves that you're the one who's wrong. You don't want a zero-sum game. But what you can do is compliment them on the great job they've been doing in the world they've been in and say you'd like to help them continue to be brilliantly, conspicuously, and lucratively successful in the world as it is going to be. You haven't been wrong. The world is changing. Um, I'm a little compulsive about sourcing my quotations. This famous quotation from John Maynard Keynes, the economist, was actually, in fact, as far as we can tell, made up by Paul Samuelson, who attributed it to Keynes. So if you want to you know, win, win a bet in a really, really upscale bar, you might be able to do it with this. Probably not. It's probably going to be the scene from Goodwill Hunting if you try, but you know. <laughs> so let's talk about the facts. Oh, the world is more connected now. Do you realize how much more connected it is? When that per first lame iPhone came along, it would have been called a 2G device, except that we didn't have 3G yet. It's like World War I was not called World War I until there was a World War II. It was a 2G radio. There was no app store. And all the connectivity on the entire planet at the time, all the computer networks, all the phone circuits, everything would have given the average human being three ringtones a day. Not the phone calls, you're on your own for that. Just the ringtones. Well, 2020 grows by a factor of 1,000. That's an awful lot of data. That's not three ringtones. That's, you know, that's not you know, 30 seconds of music. That's five versions of Beethoven's Ninth with annotations. There's a lot you can learn when you can collect that much about what people seem to be trying to do. And we've made some pretty huge investments at Salesforce and things like Crux to do that, to figure out what those moving dots in the sky really mean. But customers tell us they don't feel more connected. They feel, in many cases, less connected than before. Because why? Because companies have invested in simplification and cost reduction and treated service as an overhead to be minimized instead of an experience creation and value opportunity to be enriched. And the problem is, you have to have these conversations up front. If you go in with a service cloud pitch, their first thought is, oh, yeah, service, wow, average call time is like two minutes. If I throw in some AI, I might be able to get that down to, you know, 80 seconds. That would be really something. Well, then you've got chatbots handling the simple cases and self-service handling all the other simple cases. And average call handle time goes from two minutes to five. And they're saying, huh? And you have to be prepared to say, no, dummy, you don't get it. Or maybe you'll say it more politely than that. I don't know how you say that in French. It probably sounds even worse in French. It probably sounds worse in French. Those five minutes are not 
an overhead to be minimized. They are a brand ambassador creating opportunity because your only credible final step in marketing today is the passionate customer, the customer zealot, the one who feels like a member of the community helping other people want to come inside. And so when 84% of customers say the experience the company provides is as important as the products and services. This is the death of many traditional luxury product categories. Um, the, uh, Walter Isaacson, who wrote the biography of Steve Jobs, the good biography of Steve Jobs, said, today to produce a genuinely amazing product requires so much investment in advanced technology that scaling that cost can only be done if the product's going to sell in quantity, which means by definition it's not a luxury product. If it's a true luxury product, it's scarce. But if it's scarce, you can't afford the costs of producing it. So his comment is, this pretty much guarantees that from now on all the really good stuff is going to be had by everybody, which is kind of a nice idea. 73% of customers say one extraordinary experience makes them expect more of everybody else. You're not competing against the people who do what you do, you're competing against the best experience they've had in the last 30 days. You're competing against pizza delivery and Netflix and Amazon. I don't care if you're an industrial components manufacturer. One of our fa uh, favorite customers makes the building heating, ventilation, and air conditioning equipment for massive office buildings. But they did a recent thought experiment where they said, if we buy a building chiller, how long does it take to figure out what else we need to install it and operate it and get it permitted and everything? Because if I buy a pair of shoes on Amazon, they offer me the spare laces and probably the matching person belt. What about a chiller? It took them an hour visiting nine different websites, all of which belonged to them, none of which looked like each other. They said, nope, not going to cut it. I want an Amazon-like experience when I'm buying a building chiller. Because if they don't, people will buy it from Amazon. And our customer will just be part of Amazon's supply chain. Because that's the alternative. If you do not engage the leadership of your company in being an experience-centered enterprise, creating and delivering that state-of-the-art experience, you will wind up being part of the supply chain operating at razor-thin margins with no brand awareness, kind of the way chips used to be before Intel came up with the idea of saying Intel inside. Brilliant idea. No one knew the name Intel at the consumer level until they did that. It, it set the bar for turning yourself into a, cons a consumer preference brand. And 66% of customers say they'll pay more. Why? Because if you give me a lousy experience for less money, I wind up giving my time to fix the things you didn't do right, and, I t and time I will never get back. And people are understanding that today. And so all the data from ourselves, from American Express, from others shows people now knowingly spend more to get it done right the first time. And the, idea, and the race to the bottom has no winners at all. Uh, but retail experiences, disconnected. Retailers don't know who I am. It can be done, can be done. I was making my way down from the, uh, the top of Mount Whitney and I was uh, poking with my pole to you know, check the snow and make sure that the path wasn't doing this while the snow seemed like it was doing this. And at one point my pole did that. I thought, okay, path goes that way. Um, and and in, the pro in the process of that uh, downhill, um, I stripped the clutch on the pole and it was, it was gonna need to be replaced. I walked into the REI store they didn't ask for a receipt. They just wanted my member number. And they said, oh yeah, fully covered. We'll replace it, of course, um, but we can actually only credit you for the sale price your wife paid for it when she bought it for your birthday two years ago. Will that be satisfactory, sir? Not a single piece of paper needed to be produced. Will I ever go anywhere else for my gear? I don't think so. If REI makes it, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna get it there because they take care of me not of their transactions, not of their return rates. They take care of me. They know my whole family. And this is just camping gear. And customers know that their devices are the magic keys that can unlock these experiences. They, they use the connected devices and they want their devices to be connected. They do not regard this as stupid technology tricks. They are no longer impressed by this. This is table sticks. This is what they expect. What happens when 
experience becomes the product. You get an interesting convergence out there. Did any of you watch the uh, coverage of the Winter Olympics, the Pyongyang Olympics on TV? I don't know if it was the same tr um, up here as it was in the U.S., but in the U.S. it was wall-to-wall -wall Walmart ads. Not a single one of which showed a person shopping in a physical Walmart store. All of them showed people using the app or having Walmart predict their need and ask them if they needed a re-delivery of another thing. And you can actually see this. Facebook and Google's price earnings ratios have converged. Used to be one of them was a much sexier company than the other. Now they're both basically in the same business. They just started from different places. Amazon and Walmart are doing the same thing. They're both distribution networks that include physical stores and include apps and include everything. They started in very different places. They're moving toward the same centroid of being the experience of, we know what you need, we'll get it to you more easily and at a lower price than anybody else. Now, I've talked, to, talked a couple of times about luxury markets and sometimes people say to me, you know, yeah, but that's the luxury market. They, they, they can afford to do this stuff. We're, we're in a business where we compete on you know, much thinner margins. We can't do that. Well, luxury markets are the best, next best thing to actual time travel. Because if you go out and see what they're doing in the luxury markets today, you're getting a preview of what's going to be expected in the mass market uh, product. It used to be a decade or two away. Now maybe it's only a few years away. And spending time there is a good idea. When Apple wanted to create that retail experience, they didn't go and tour Best Buy or Circuit City. Who exactly? They went to the Ritz-Carlton and the Four Seasons hotels and, and just kind of soaked in through their pores. What is, a, what is a completely transparent, immersive, luxury experience feel like? And then they brought that to something that had never had that before, which was consumer electronics. And the result is that when the Apple Watch came out, market's first reaction was, oh, Apple's really blown it this time. And their, their product is by far the most expensive, and they briefly flirted with making you know, a very high-end luxury version of that. Not so much, and Johnny Ive's gone now, so I think they're going to you know, regain their sanity on that subject. But in the meantime, Apple this year will ship more watches than Switzerland. Not just Rolex. Switzerland! You know, home of Swatch. This is not anymore a niche product. And of course, you know what they really did that, that accomplished this. The Series 4 product, brilliant pivot from a fitness product to a wellness product. My wife was totally fine with her Fitbit when it was just a matter of exercise tracking. Then the Series 4 Apple Watch had an EKG. Want to guess what she's wearing? She's wearing that Apple Watch and she, before, the need to think about recharging every two days was a complete no, you know, deal breaker for her. But once it did that, she was, we, 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 we're getting one this afternoon. That was a brilliant move, because everyone eventually is going to want wellness support. We'll talk about that a little later. So if you start at the high end with something like Formula One racing, where infinitesimally thin improvements in performance are the difference between winning and not winning, which is only like, you know, everything in that business, McLaren, whose name you may know as an automobile racing and a supercar brand, um, uses biometric profiling of pit crews so that those amazing tire changes that you see and you say that can't possibly have been real time, that has to have been a sped up video. No, it wasn't. They really do change that tire that quickly. Those pit crews, work assignments and travel schedules are optimized based on individual biometric and cognitive profiling because they can. You can afford it in that business. You have to throw that kind of money at that business to get any advantage you possibly can. Well, I want you to imagine how quickly McLaren Applied Technologies, their consulting arm, is going to be going out to factories, airlines, any place where people do stuff, where safety of life depends on cognitive alertness and you know, physical uh, readiness to deal with a situation, and say, you really want to be sued for dereliction and negligence because you were not doing biometric and cognitive profiling of these people in these key safety critical jobs? It's going to turn into an expectation, and maybe soon, very, after, very soon after that, a regulatory mandate that you will do this. Everyone wants to know more. Scania makes over-the-road trucks. So a few years ago, they commissioned 
a uh, company to produce a trucker's watch that monitored the vehicle, fuel consumption, fuel level, time of day, took certain um, necessary functions like logging whether people were taking their breaks and stuff and automated those and you know, improved record keeping and improved compliance with various safety criteria. And you'll notice at the top right, the thing sold out in no time. Truckers loved this thing and their employers loved it too because now the records are being kept without anyone you know, uh, fudging the truth on how many hours they'd driven without a break and things like that. But did they commission a second batch? Nope, didn't need to, because now there was a platform. And all they had to do was put their app on a rapidly becoming mass market priced platform, namely the Apple Watch, and all they had to do to make it a Scania watch was put a fancy wristband on it. That's what happens. That's what happens when innovation becomes platformized when now there's a, gen a general purpose device that can take on new personalities on which you can create a distinctive experience, valuable to your customer, valuable to your customer's boss, and turn it into something that makes your brand better than the others. You know what happens if your brand is six weeks ahead and the other guys catch up? And you get six weeks ahead, and eventually they catch up. Maybe you get another six weeks ahead, and this time they, they catch up pretty quick. Eventually you have 100% market share. Because if all they ever do is catch up, the people who defected to you do not go back. When Merrill Lynch realized that the economics of cash management allowed them to offer high net worth individuals overnight cash sweep facilities that previously had only been available to global 2000 companies and invented the Merrill Lynch cash management account, Shearson lost a whole bunch of customers to Amex. They didn't get them back six months later when they hired some people away from Amex as quickly as they could you know, throw bonuses at them and implemented a similar capability. That just, that just kept them in the game, but the loss of market share was a ratcheting effect. You must be in the lead whenever you can. But in the process, we're going to have to start getting really smart about this data thing. Because it's not just going to be transactional records of what happened yesterday. We're going to have to start thinking about data in genuinely different ways from the way enterprises have traditionally done this. For example, at one point, if you said to your cardiologist, my Fitbit's got all this great data on my heart, what can we do with that? Your cardiologist would go deer in the lights and say, I have no idea what to do with that data. I have no way to ingest it, no way to analyze it. And yet, in September of last year, John Hancock, which was early to the game of offering people the chance to put Fitbit data into their life insurance rate determination, now announced in just about uh, two days before Dreamforce last year that they would no longer offer any policies without that feature. That's now the default. You want life insurance from us and you want to get the good price? You're going to give us data on whether you're maintaining physical activity, how you're doing. But almost everything we know about cardiological data is based on measurements of people who look like me. Old, white guys with money to spend on cardiology. And when you take what you've learned by studying us and look at people of different genders, different ethnicities, different ages, different diets, whatever, maybe the things you see don't mean what they used to mean. And further, it used to be that they would only strap a tape recorder on me and you know, put, put stickers on my chest and check my heart behavior for 24 hours if there'd been an episode that suggested they needed to do that. Now, we've got asymptomatic people suddenly being awakened at 1 a.m. because their watch says they're going to die. Or at least that's what they think it's saying. The doctors don't know what to do about this because Bayesian inference tells you that when most of your results are false positives, the false positives drown out the false negatives big time, more than half of the time, even though the accuracy of the Apple Watch is very, very high on designating AFib episodes and things like that, even though the accuracy is extremely high, more than half of its diagnoses will be false, false positives. The system's got to learn how to deal with this. You have to develop a whole new language of how to talk to people about data when the data is being collected not because there was a reason to collect it, but because it was a cheap side effect of what they were doing anyway. So congratulations, now we can collect it all. You know what happens when the dog finally catches the car? It's got to figure out what to do with it. Same thing with the data. And the first part is not the fun part. You ever swept a clean room and been disgusted by the time you got to the corner? And said, oh my gosh, I can't believe the filth I was walking around on all these weeks? You get it all in one place and you say, oh. Well, this is what's happening is people take 
fragments and shards and splinters of process and identity and bring them all together to try to feed them to an AI and say, oh my gosh, gaps, errors, inconsistencies. Uh, the AI projects, the, the I part is the easy part. Inference and logic and deduction, Aristotle had that figured out. He got a lot of other things wrong, but logic he kind of figured out. And the problem is that the data is such garbage and people can unconsciously deal with that and algorithms do not. Best time to plant a tree for shade is 20 years ago and the best time to start your data overhaul was three years ago. And someone says, we got the AI working. Great, what are you gonna feed it? You're gonna feed it that dog's breakfast we've got down in the basement? I mean, you know, we've got MuleSoft, and we've got you know, a lot of good tools for cleaning it, but it doesn't happen instantaneously. This is important because, as Tom Peters pointed out in 1987 in his book, Thriving on Chaos, there are almost no genuine protective moats left today other than your knowledge of your customer and, their, and your market. Everything else moves across borders, moves around the planet with startling agility and lowering, constantly lowering cost. But knowing more is the most important competitive advantage. You want to know if people really think Brexit's going to happen? Take a look at the amount of extra inventory of champagne, brandy, and Swiss watches that was being inventoried in the UK during the weeks before the uh, so-called hard deadline for Brexit. They thought it was going to happen. They were putting money on the table that said, we do not want to be caught without, without the, the stuff we need. And, and you can inventory a very high dollar value of Swiss watches in a suitcase. So yeah, data properly examined, aggressively considered, tells you what's gonna happen before other people can figure it out. And you need a lot of compute power to do that. Fortunately, there's another exponential curve out there in the world which is the quantity of compute power that's available to us. Yeah, that's another exponential curve. That one, by the way, is not a cumulative curve. That's added annual power per year. So if I put that on a logarithmic scale, it's a straight line, but not nearly as dramatic. This way it looks like we discovered computers in 2005. And it turns out that when you throw that much computing power at data, you thought you had nice anonymous data. Oh. Oh boy, I can buy databases from any major cell phone carrier that will show you that some phone, carefully anonymized, leaves my home address, which is a matter of public record, I can look that up almost anywhere, and goes to the Salesforce office on a fairly regular basis, but the phone is completely anonymous. And every now and then that same phone goes and visits a cardiology office. All of the data is completely anonymous. How hard is it to figure out that I or someone I know either has or is about to have a cardiology issue? You know, you can talk anonymity all you want, but when you throw enough computational inference at so-called anonymous data, an awful lot about people quickly emerges. Regulators are nowhere near where they think they are in getting this under control. GDPR, I'm sorry, the ink is still wet on the page. There is no case law, and many researchers will tell you it's not even theoretically possible to be completely compliant with every single thing in GDPR simultaneously. Simple example. One rule says anything that touches data that's owned by a person, the person must be notified. Very straightforward, high-minded, idealistic principle. Another high-minded idealistic principle is that if a person is a target of a criminal investigation, the custodian of their data may not advise them that they are the target of an investigation. You want to tell me how you meet both those requirements at once? Because I don't think it's even possible. And we're already helping customers figure out what's my posture going to be in an environment like that. But with all that computational power, which means the ability to do robust encryption, with all of that connectivity, which means the ability to do distributed networks of data instead of massive centralized databases, so-called distributed ledgers start to become a real thing. You know them perhaps more often uh, by their uh, term blockchain, which is a special case. Healthcare, it's gonna be completely revolutionized by this. Education, we're gonna be in the educational system for our entire lives now. It's pretty stupid to have to go back to the place that gave you your degree 30 years ago for your transcript 
you should own that transcript. It should be sitting in an intermediary free, trustworthy network. And we are working actively with customers in higher ed, healthcare, and various other government operations to bring distributed ledgers, because healthcare is not the only one. Every sector needs to reconsider governance, auditability, the customer experience that's going to be enabled by these new distributed models. I'm very pleased that we now have a blockchain offering announced and forthcoming. And it's not about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is to blockchain what selling books was to the internet. Yes, it does that. But that's not the, the really good stuff. Now, there's already a lot of hype out there, so there are good checklists out there where, which will allow you to say to someone, no, I'm sorry, what you're talking about is not a blockchain. It's just a distributed database. You don't have this key requirement, which means you're not going to get the benefits that you are being promised. And I would encourage you to you know, have that little checklist in mind. Um, it has a lot of great applications. LVMH, a great Salesforce customer, is talking already about having its own blockchain teams that do things like prove the provenance of luxury products, which are susceptible, as I'm sure you know, to uh, costly counterfeiting. This is a very straightforward application of what blockchain can, in principle, do. But it's not just for luxury products. People who could never participate in the uh, um, uh, AB InBev supply chain, because they didn't exist as far as the banking and, and finance systems were concerned, can now prove their participation and receive financial services in ways that they could not before because Anheuser-Busch InBev uh, has, has moved aggressively to let them all be participants off their cheap mobile phones, not even smartphones, participate on that trustworthy intermediary free network. This is going to change the world in some amazing, empowering ways. But for heaven's sake, don't walk into the office and say, we need a blockchain initiative. Because those are all the reasons why you don't need one. There's lots of situations where it's just overkill or irrelevant or going to create all sorts of issues if you insist, oh no, this has to be done with a blockchain. No, it doesn't. Doing it with a blockchain would be the slow, expensive way to do it. But if you have a use case at the bottom, simply summarized as multiple interdependent parties need to make alterations to a persistent data record shared by them all without any of them being, without, with at least one of them being unwilling to trust any third party to own the data. That's like your one sentence statement. If you have all those criteria, yeah, you might really benefit from doing a blockchain type approach. My goal personally is that you'll store your data with us and Einstein will figure out whether it should be stored in a massive immutable database for maximum volume and highest performance at lowest cost or in a traditional relational structure for normal cases or in a blockchain because it meets the other special criteria. And you'll just have one universal Salesforce storage API and you won't need to know the 15 different implementations of storage on the back end. And boy, was that a forward looking statement. So you want a revolution? We talk a lot about the fourth industrial revolution, a three-year-old idea. In fact, we talked about it so much that we and Davos are the two biggest spikes in global traffic on that conversation. So that's kind of cool. Um, but the biggest mistake is that it was ever allowed to be a conversation about technologies. And so help me, the drinking game I could play every time someone says, steam, electricity, computers, and I just want to face upon myself and say, will you stop talking about steam? It was never about steam. It was about scalability of production, the ability to build factories, which created the necessity of an urbanized workforce to come and serve the factories. Because you can't make lots and lots and lots of tiny little steam engines. It's not really feasible. But then you had electricity, and you could distribute the power, and now you could go back to entrepreneurial workshops and hand tools and things. So there was a social consequence. And that's a much more interesting statement than, ooh, it's electricity. And then you add information to the power, and now you can have a smart grid. And then you add intelligence, and you can have an optimized behavior. And so these things boil down into four simple ideas, the production, the distribution, the interaction, and the optimization revolutions. And when I do it this way, you'll notice something very interesting. They're not sequential. They're cumulative. People say the first revolution was the steam revolution. Therefore, it can't be important anymore because we don't use steam anymore. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Smart manufacturing is still a thing. Smart power grids are still a thing. Autonomous uh, trucks and 3D printing that completely change the economics of our supply chains and our logistics are very much a thing. And doing it all with distributed intelligence, well, that's 
driving an awful lot of conversation today, but you must see that they are cumulative concurrent changes, not a series of changes. Because if I take that 1900 factory and I take out the steam engine and I put in an electric motor, I'll be such a hero. It's cleaner, it's quieter. Oh, wait a minute, all the machines still go on at the same moment and off at the same moment and run at exactly the same speed. I can't have a flexible factory with that situation. I certainly can't get from the thing on the left to the thing on the right just by going from steam to electricity. No, I need to rethink the whole process. And Tim Harford talked about this. He said, you know, you had to redesign the factory and then you had to redesign the worker because the workers had to make independent decisions. They had to be better trained and they were worth more money. And Eric Benielson and Lauren Hitz said, is the same thing true for IT? It turns out it is. Companies that plug the, old, the new technology into their old culture and process get very disappointing returns, sometimes negative returns. Companies that reorganize for more decentralization and greater collaboration get amazing returns with the tech. In fact, almost as good as the companies that do that without the tech. The combination, though, absolutely the crusher, where you want to be. And if no one's unhappy about it, it's probably not a revolution. The in-flight magazine articles make it sound like this is going to be Tomorrowland. Other people think it's going to be more like uh, Elysium. The first 20 minutes of Elysium are the most scarily realistic depiction of what I think people are afraid will happen to their kids that I've ever seen. They filmed it in one of the world's largest garbage dumps in Mexico. That wasn't Photoshop. They did the real thing. The actors were terrified of what they might be breathing. Even if you don't want to watch the whole movie, the first 20 minutes of Elysium are going to burn into your brain what people are afraid is coming at them, where the best job you can get is painting the robot that then winds up picking up its baton and telling you to move along. And so fundamental change, yeah, you got to be ready. The jobocalypse is coming. No, it's not. Barcode scanners don't mean we don't have people at the front of the grocery store, but now it means they're asking you questions like, so, sir, did you find everything you were looking for today? I see you bought some yogurt. Would you like spoons for that? Oh, you're taking it home. Okay, great. Hope we'll see you again tomorrow. They can do what people do because now they've got a machine to do what machines do better. This matters. There was a, almost an anthropological study, I'll call it, done at MIT and Wellesley a few decades ago where they asked people, how well did we do at teaching you subject matter knowledge, curiosity, computer skills, and so on. Now, why are these bars ordered this way? It's not alphabetic, and it's not in order from biggest to smallest. Because the blue bars are how important they realized those things were once they got out into the world. And yeah, I was educated out the wazoo on subject matter knowledge, and that was pretty good. But I was not taught to collaborate. I was not taught to speak and write and present. Uh, Leah, I think you talked you know, yesterday about just how important it is that you be prepared to get up on your feet and deliver. And, pr and change people's minds, because if you don't change their minds, you will not change their behavior. And if you don't change their behavior, at best, you're just entertaining them. And the talent pool of tomorrow is going to look very different. Our, our demographics are wired for an age distribution from bottom to top that looks like that. Tons and tons of little kids, many of whom will die of childhood disease before they start spending money or being in the workforce, and very, very tiny numbers of people over 65. In the U.S., the, the age 65 has a certain mythical um, um, relevance because that's when you can start collecting the old age pension that we call Social Security. When Social Security was passed into law, only 10% of people lived to be 65. And now most people will spend several decades being older than that, and the system has never been genuinely redesigned for that reality of 2020 when the age distribution starts to, shall we say, straighten out a little bit, let alone 2050. If I were to fast forward that to another few decades, it would be a rectangle, because within the lifetime of my grandchildren, the number of people on the planet in each five-year age range from zero through 65 will be roughly the same. No one can tell me they've got a playbook for a world with that demographic distribution. Healthcare, transportation, the workforce, nothing will be as we have known it. This is not incremental change. This is revolution, and it's an amazing opportunity, but also a huge challenge. Because the half-life of your skills, two to three years. You graduate with your four-year degree, roughly half of what you were being taught is no longer considered leading-edge knowledge within five years. So the idea of the four-year degree equipping you for life, it's a capital purchase. No, I'm sorry, we need a subscription model for education, just like we do for IT. 
Who knew? Employers say their people need more education to keep up with their jobs. 94% of employees say, if my employer is investing in me and maintaining my value, I'm going to stay with them. I'm not worried about being thrown away by them. And yet Paul Dougherty, my friend at Accenture, says 50% of companies say their people aren't prepared and only 3% are increasing training investments. And you wonder why we spend so much time talking about Trailhead. Because my Trailhead, now that it's GA, lets me walk into a company and say, you can deliver gamified, modular, self-paced learning tailored to the needs of your particular company in a way that's demonstrably consumed and liked by people who will stay with you longer when they are satisfied that you are maintaining their economic contribution into their 60s and their 70s. It's wonderful. It's so cool that we can be part of that answer to that question that some people are terrified even to begin asking. Here's one of the problems, though. We all think we're woke now. We all think we know about our biases and prejudices. Guess what? You can't see that those lines are the same length, no matter how many times I tell you that it's an optical illusion. I'm sorry, your brain can't do that. You need to be equipped with tools that allow you to overcome what your brain is trying to lyingly tell you. And we need to create cultures in which no one is allowed to say, oh, I've got 50 years experience here. I, I, don't need, I don't need that metric. I don't need those tools. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You're, you are kidding yourself. You're, being conscious of your biases doesn't make them go away. It seems kind of obvious when you put it that way, doesn't it? And it, many of us seem to feel that now that we've had a, a lean-in circle and talked about our biases, we're all going to start behaving better. Maybe not. But we can build cultures in which we confront them and don't pretend that they're not there. So we've started a new Ohana group at uh, Salesforce. It's kind of a cool one. Because almost by definition, it has no allies, only people who don't yet realize they're members. Because everyone is eventually going to be aware of the challenges and the opportunities of a five-generation workforce. We've had a lot of great conversations within the company about this in the last six months and said, you know, there's a lot of cross-generational mentoring going on. This group was briefly, briefly conceived with the idea that it would be called, I blush to admit it, I was not in the room at the time, but they were actually talking about calling it Silver Force. <laughs> Excuse me, platinum, please, but. And it was going to be for people thinking about retirement and thinking about age discrimination. And fortunately, at about the time that I was asked to become involved in it, they said, you know, this would be so much more powerful if it were about cross-generational mentoring. And the fact that, what the phrase that we're using now is the uncoupling of life stage from calendar age. Because it used to be if you were in your 20s, you were a recent graduate. If you were in your 30s, you were a young family. If you were in your 50s, you were a near retiree. And now the fastest growing cadre of new entrants to the workforce in the United States is women over 50. Yeah, thank you. And it's amazing. It's amazing what coming out of a massive recession will do for all those people who had put the divorce on hold. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of women are discovering, I finally kicked, kicked myself loose from that guy, but now I need a job. And HR departments don't know what to do with these people. They'll be told simultaneously, your college degree makes you overqualified for anything that your experience allows us to you know, pay you to do. The, 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 the experience and the age and the thing, everything's out of alignment. They used to know, and now they don't. So what are the facts that we should be seeing now? Because I said at the beginning we were going to talk about some four you know, big, big pockets of truth. Can I have just a few more minutes past 5.30? Okay, because this is, this is kind of cool. This is going to be fun. Because I could otherwise I could just say, so you all go out now and check out some facts. But no, let's actually talk about a few. Number one. Percentage of population age 60 or over by region. I've already alluded to this, but notice the geographical variation. Um, you know, Northern Europe, it's going to skyrocket. World as a whole, a lot. Europe, way high. The places where birth rate is down because the economy has sucked for the last 15 years are getting gray very, very quickly because they are way below replacement rate on population. In fact, North America would be getting worse even faster if it weren't for immigration from Mexico. George Friedman wrote a terrific book called The Next Hundred Years in which he observes that if without immigration from Mexico into the U.S., uh, the U.S. would be you know, completely hosed from an economic point of view, which is why it's so horrible to see the way it's being mishandled. Let's talk about Africa for a minute. Big place. 
Hard to connect the stuff in the middle. The fast as you lay the copper wires, they get dug up for their scrap value. But then, you start doing narrow casting satellite beams and you have 4,000 completely separate steerable channels for the African continent. And life gets really interesting. Because all of a sudden now, you've got Chinese investment in massive infrastructure, you've got family size shrinking, educational level rising, and you've got the country going middle class very, very quickly. Sorry, the continent going middle class very quickly. Then there's this. Lots of us grew up with a map like this on our classroom walls. It does a magnificent job of making Asia look like it's in two pieces. Um, it horribly distorts the sizes of various properties. It's, a, it's a, a really bad thing for your brain. Flip it upside down and ask yourself what fraction of the world's population, economic value, and growth are in that ellipse and realize that China has Australia and Africa as its pantry and is publishing the majority of the world's advanced AI and computer graphics research today. Going to be a different place. All of a sudden, New York and London don't look so interesting anymore, do they? And if you don't have a strategy for that Pacific Rim world, then your strategy is, is you know, scrutinizing your rearview mirror in great detail. Um, how big is Africa? Well, I'm sorry, Greenland is tiny. The thing on below is the actual relative sizes. But just for illustration, that's the United States, China, India, um, Eastern Europe, France, Spain, and in pretty much everything else packed into the territorial area of Africa. Let's just say that its potential has been underappreciated for the last few tens or hundreds of years. Their middle class is going to grow. And you wanted to clean up the planet with electric cars? Well, I hope you know where you're going to be getting your lithium and your cobalt, because China's got most of those under contract, and they're all pouring into China right now as we speak. Trying to build electric cars at any kind of massive scale without confronting that reality uh, is um, delusional. The problem is that because sea ice is uh, retracting, the fraction of the Arctic that's suddenly open to petroleum exploration is actually going up. So if you thought we were going to get past peak petroleum and build electric cars real quick, I've got two slides that I just showed you that suggest maybe there's some push-pull going on there. And that's going to be a tremendous challenge, especially in this country, where the hydrocarbon industry is pretty darn important to your, for your foreign exchange opportunities. I'm going to be in Calgary in just a few weeks talking about how do we deal with this. We've already built enough power plants to heat the planet. In fact, a very unfortunate result just came out today that the ice sheet in Greenland was not supposed to slide on rock. It was supposed to need like mud or something underneath it. And the phrase used was, it's happily sliding to the sea. And the thing about ice sheets is that when they go into the water, the water level does go up. Floating ice, when it melts, doesn't change the water level dump an ice sheet in, and yeah, you start to talk about centimeters. Um, anyone see what's going on in New Orleans today? Yeah, my wife hates it when I talk like this. So innovation. Innovation has to be viewed not as buying better tools to do the stuff we used to do, but as a pantry full of ingredients to collect and predict, to work with sustainability as a product strategy, to do bold things like what Patagonia does, saying, don't buy this jacket. Please, don't, don't buy new stuff unless you're going to take the old stuff and bring it to us and let us you know, maintain it and upcycle it. This is, this is part of the brand today for so many companies is what are you doing? How are you changing your definition of your success and your behavior to deal with these realities? And the number of different systems involved. This is a, the national critical functions list maintained by the U.S. government. Things like satellite access, things like road and sea transportation, things like conducting elections with confidence and reliability, things like housing. All of these things, all of these critical systems are really what we all do. We don't run CRM. I, don't, I didn't join Salesforce to, to build CRM products. I built Salesforce to save the freaking world. It was the only place I saw where I would have a, a good chance of being able to do that. That's why I took the job. So people, connections, resources, and systems. That, that is our business. That is our opportunity. That is our children's and grandchildren's question to us about, so what did you do 
back in 2019? The answer is what you guys decide to do on Monday. Because when the facts change, I change my mind. He may not have ever said it, but the famous quote has one final sentence. What do you do? If you go back to work on Monday and you do what you would have done, and remember this is a great chance to get together and improve some of your Salesforce skills, it will have been as successful as putting an electric motor in a 1900s factory. Great ROI, impressive results, and it will leave most of the potential value on the table. I need you to leave this room with a conviction that some of the things that Leah was talking about, some of the things that Chris was talking about, are gonna to be tools that you will put to work to have conversations that would not otherwise have arisen, to nurture and focus talent that might not otherwise have reached its potential, and to make your own career really, really exciting and fun. And I'm talking to you too. Thanks for coming. I've already gone over my time on a Friday night, and I shouldn't do that, but I know we've got tickets, and I know you want tickets because there's really interesting stuff they want to give away. So um, I know I've got someone out there with an envelope and a microphone in the back. Um, while, uh, while, while Sarah's getting set up, um, anyone want to tell me how full of it I am and what I've completely ignored because that way I'm doing research? Yeah, back, back of the room. Uh, I'm sort of, I'm in that, uh age range is sort of close to you probably oh i might have a few years on you but yeah anyway uh well i just in my first job since university i went to university stayed there worked the whole time and i'm in i'm basically re-entering the workforce late 50s yep and learning a whole bunch of new skills that i didn't think i was going to learn at this point well the good news is i said in the women's panel yesterday is so's everybody else so, in the, so is everyone else in the room. And don't apologize for the fact that you're younger, that, that, that you're not learning it, um, uh, how do I want to phrase this? You're learning it in a way that lets you put the new stuff into a context that you've formed with decades of practical experience while they're learning those skills in a way that's context free. You have the opportunity to learn it and use it in ways that they don't yet have the wetware network to put to work. And you need to see that as your advantage and not as anything for which you ever need to apologize. I have had so many people who look like us come up to me and say, I was worried that I wouldn't have a role here as the new technology comes along. And now you're showing me that the things I know that they don't are things they're going to need 20 years to, to acquire. And I can acquire the things they know that I don't in two years or less. So be bold. You know, like I said yesterday, be the carbon in the room. There's pl plenty of hydrogen and helium in the world, and all it does is make big balls of hot plasma. They're very, very bright, but they ain't intelligent. Feel free to do with that metaphor what you will. <laughs> I know it's late. I should take probably one more question. Yes, sir. But he's getting asked, asked lots of questions, so I'm going to get one more besides him. <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I mean in addition to. I don't mean instead of. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if... If you have to catch a flight right after? No, nope, I'm leaving or? tomorrow morning. Okay, so if we could. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for the evening, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, to you know, keep this going as soon as I'm allowed to, but I you know, want the official end of the event to happen today, um, <laughs> not, not, tomorrow, not, not after midnight. So uh, is, is there anything else that the whole room would benefit from hearing? Because otherwise I, I'm pcoffee at salesforce.com, and I'm playing old Peter Coffey on Twitter, and as far as I'm concerned, the conversation is 24-7. All right, thanks again. Thank you so much, Peter.